As a parent, you can do everything right. You can know how to take excellent care of yourself, excellent care of your baby and your loved ones. You can eat right. You can have impeccable hand washing. You can breastfeed. You can be like really smart and understand and know germ theory and how viruses are transmitted. And yet still, the inevitable will happen and eventually your baby will get sick. And RSV is the number one reason that babies are hospitalized. And there are outbreaks of RSV every fall through spring. So today we're going to be talking about RSV. We're going to be talking all about what you need to know for mild to severe RSV. My name is Maria Chaudhry. I'm a midwife and an herbalist. I'm the owner and creator of Birdsong Botanicals and we make nourishing herbal remedies for women and children. But what I'm not is a doctor. And this is an educational video. And what you do with this information is entirely up to you. My intention of this video is to give you an understanding, a foundational understanding about the illness and your options and ways you can treat it at home and what to expect if you have to go to the hospital. <clears throat> So, I also want to just let you know, this is a continuation of our videos. We've been making a whole series about immune health. So this is a continuation about those videos. And I really, those other videos are important to this conversation because a person usually doesn't just have a cough or just have a fever. So particularly RSV, RSV prevent presents with a cough and a fever. And so you'll want to look to those videos on how to treat fever, coughs, and earaches. Okay, so let's just get started talking about RSV. Uh, every once in a while I'm going to look at my notes just to keep us on the same page because this is actually pretty important. So RSV is respiratory syncytial virus, right? And it's kind of a mouthful to say but it is a super common virus. It is pervasive, right? It can range from mild symptoms like a common cold and or it can become really severe and require hospitalization. Usually the illness lasts one to two weeks. And like I said before, this illness is the number one reason that babies are going to the hospital. So I want you to really pay attention to this conversation. But I also want you to remember that the vast majority of babies are not that sick. I read a statistic that said 98% of children ages zero to two years old will get RSV. That's like nearly every child will get RSV. And that's just what I want to leave you with. The importance is only about 2% of those babies will actually get so sick that they need a high level of care. That means the vast majority of babies, zero to two, will be able to be appropriately cared for at home with natural remedies in collaboration with your pediatrician. Okay? Here's one of the problems about RSV, specifically with infants and newborns. I also want to say there is a, a category of high-risk groups of people that could be more susceptible to the illness. So the primary high-risk category would be a baby that is born prematurely or a baby that has a lung condition or a heart condition. Those are immediately high-risk they're most susceptible. But then you can take any nor newborn that's less than 10 weeks old, they can be more susceptible, or any person, no matter what their age is, if they have chronic lung conditions, or a person that has known food allergies and they're eating those foods, and in other words, they're eating the gluten and the dairy and they have a lot of phlegm and mucus, those people are susceptible to RSV. Okay, so the problem with newborns particularly is RSV presents with a cough, a fever, and congestion. But they, the congestion is so thick and heavy and they don't know how to clear their lungs. They're 
they're obligated they're called obligatory nasal breathers they want to breathe out of their nose and when it's really congested and they don't know how to clear it and they need assistance to clear it that can lead to respiratory distress that's what leads to rapid breathing or shallow breathing or a croupy cough and then another thing about RSV is it can just be RSV or it can start to become more complicated. It can start to become pneumonia or bronchiolitis. It can lead to ear infections. And so it can become more and more complicated. Bronchiolitis, in case you're wondering, bronchiolitis is it's a viral infection of the bronchioles, particularly the, the smallest parts of the bronchioles, and RSV is the primary virus that causes this viral lung infection. That's what bronchiolitis is. Bronchiolitis and these, this, when RSV starts to become more complicated, that also starts to lead to the, the severity and the need for hospitalization. Okay. We've talked about that. But what I want to talk about now is since RSV is like a common cold, that oftentimes if you just have symptoms of a common cold and it's not too severe and you go to the doctor, the doctor's not going to do any major testing, right? They're not going to know if it's a common cold and they're not going to know it's RSV, but it's going to look close enough. And if the baby is not in the high risk category or not super sick, they're probably not going to do a bunch of testing for it, okay? And I also want you to know, like I said before, that the vast majority of babies and people that get RSV, they have, like I said, mild cold-like symptoms. And the, most of the time, they'll resolve on their own. So it's completely appropriate to manage mild to moderate RSV symptoms at home with natural remedies in collaboration with your pediatrician. So let's start talking about how to take care of RSV. And really, I'm just going to do a list because I've kind of gone made a bunch of these videos and so I'm not going to elaborate on all these things because I've already done that. But essentially, the child has a fever and is coughing, has a bunch of mucus, and so a nice thing to start with would be a, a humidifier, a cool mist humidifier to moisten the air, moisten their nasal passages, and then also a hot steam. So hot steams, steam baths, steam tents, gargles, herb baths, all of those are great ways to moisten and to break up the, um, the mucus so that they can have a more productive cough. So just the steam itself helps do that, but then when you combine it with herbs like thyme and lavender, then that becomes more therapeutic and more medicinal, and the therapeutic actions of the thyme and the lavender can directly um, attack the, the virus, and it can also help support the immune system. So I would recommend children healing herb bath for that. You can also utilize these uh, nasal saline solutions and squirt it up their nose and that'll break up the mucus and so you can clear their nose better. Usually when you use the saline solution or the steam to break up the mucus, you might need to actually aspirate or suck out the mucus. So this is a bulb syringe and in case you've never used one before, let me show you. So this is kind of a big one and um, they have other products called the Nose Frida which I've actually never used because I'm a midwife and I always used a Delee suction catheter and it's small and I just got it out of my birth bag and it would work better. But you might have one of these. So I want to show you how to use it just in case. First thing you want to do is you want to squeeze it and then when you put it in your baby's nose, do not shove it up their nose. Don't try to get it far up there because you're going to irritate all those tissues. You're going to cause them to gag and it's just going to cause way more problems and it's going to lead to more respiratory distress. So start again. Squeeze it and then just place it right at the very entrance of the nose and then suck it out. Then squeeze it right at the entrance of the nose and suck it out. Okay. I just really want to stress that they're not going to like the bulb syringe having that you're going to kind of have to wrangle them to do it and yet you're going to have to be super gentle and don't go too deep. Okay? 
The other thing is hydration. Remember, they have a fever, they have a cough. What is one of the biggest problems of fever and cough is dehydration. Dehydration is once the baby gets dehydrated, that's one of the leading reasons they end up in the hospital. So let's prevent that. And our family, when Sequoia was little, even still, I even told him this the other day and he's 15. Every time you cough, take a sip. Every time. So if it's a newborn or a child, every time they cough, you just try to give them a little sip of water. And if it's a newborn, try your best to maybe nerve some, give them some breast milk. Then that leads right into the next thing. If you're breastfeeding and you're almost at the weaning point and you're like, oh shoot, I'm about to wean this baby and they get sick, keep breastfeeding for a little while longer and just nurse them as much as possible. And I'm gonna talk more about breastfeeding here in just a second for all you breastfeeding moms out there to give you some extra tips. And then after you've gotten those primary things done, now you're gonna to start to look to herbs, right? You're gonna to wanna to look to decongestant herbs, you're gonna to wanna to look to antiviral herbs, and you're gonna to wanna to look to immune supporting herbs. So decongesting herbs that are safe for newborns, that would be thyme. And so that's gonna be in children's respiratory support. And then also antiviral herbs, that'll be elderberry. Elderberry is well known, well studied to be safe for children, babies, and it is shown to be effective against the flu virus and all sorts of viruses, especially the RSV virus. So you want your immune um, supporting antiviral elderberry. You'll also want other immune boosting herbs. So other immune boosting herbs would be echinacea, organ grapefruit, yarrow, and then that would be found in your children's immune boost. Also children's immune boost is gonna be really specific for supporting their fever, okay? And now when you have an older child or an older person, start giving them bone broth Make sure they have electrolytes, give them emergency drinks, vitamin C drinks. Babies can also have vitamin D, 400 units I use. They can also have uh, probiotics. The vitamin D and the probiotics will help boost their immunity. And then the last thing I kind of want to mention is this chest rub. So you can make your own chest rub with essential oils. You can utilize, what I really suggest you utilize is the onion and garlic oil. Onion and garlic are wonderful antiseptic herbs and they're also really great at pulling out and drawing out infection and they're safe and gentle for the baby and there's a whole video about that in the cough section. Okay, so your onion and garlic, you can make an oil and rub it on their chest, on their throat, on their back, on their feet. So those are a good way to help with that and also you can go, I'm going back to elderberry really quick. Elderberry, the antiviral. Elderberry syrup is a great option for children. The problem with elderberry syrup is oftentimes it's made with honey. So if you're dealing with a baby that's less than a year old, you're not going to want to have honey in your syrup. If you want to learn how to make your own syrup and learn more about these herbs, we have a free course called Herbs for Kids, an online course, and there'll be a link in the description below. Okay, so you'll want to sign up for that, and it's free. It doesn't, the course doesn't specifically say RSV. It'll talk about coughs in general, but it'll all apply. Okay? Okay, so I said I was going to share something with breastfeeding moms. So breastfeeding moms... You know, you might want to protect yourself and enhance and support your own immune system because RSV is incredibly contagious. So you'll want to start to have utilize your immune boosting herbs like your elderberry and your echinacea and your organ grapefruit. So you can be taking children's respiratory support or you can take the more concentrated version which is elderberry complex. You can also be drinking your herb teas, your immune teas, and your roots and fruits tea. What I really want to let you know, though, is when you're drinking and taking herbal remedies, those therapeutic properties will pass through your breast milk and filter through your body and pass through your breast milk, and you'll be giving not only the naturally occurring medicinal properties of your mother's milk, but you'll also be giving the therapeutic properties of the herbs. So your milk will be even more medicinal than it already is, which is pretty amazing. You can also 
be boosting your own immune system with increasing your vitamin C and your vitamin D. Those would be great ways to take good care of yourself and keep yourself really hydrated. Because this child's gonna be sick for a while, so you kinda need all your resources so that you can be there for them, okay? Another thing to keep in mind, I kinda mentioned this before, but RSV has, these infants have such thick mucus that it's really hard to get out and they don't know how to get it out. The only thing they've got working for them is they have a cough reflex. And so they start coughing and coughing and coughing really hard and really strong. And then what happens is they cough so hard and strong that they vomit all over the place. And they're just vomiting all over the place. Poor sweet babies. And so uh, just a, a little tip to help minimize that is keeping them upright as much as possible. So when you're breastfeeding them, instead of side lying and laying down, you're trying to figure out a way to breastfeed them with their head propped up or if you're feeding them or they're eating. And when you're sleeping, instead of just laying them down flat on the back or lay them, you want to prop them up. So ideally, if you're a co-sleeper, you just, you're already doing this probably, but in the nook of your arm, just prop their head up and let them sleep right there in the nook of your arm sitting up. This will also help prevent the mucus from settling in their ears and help prevent ear infections from later. So I just wanted to give you that tip. Okay, so I use the word prevention. RSV is incredibly contagious. I mean, they cough, they sneeze, they get that spit all over the place, and it is contagious. So it typically is contagious for three to eight days, and then symptoms usually start about three to five days after they've been infected. But what I wanted to say is that virus <coughs> can live on your skin for about 30 minutes. That's not too long but it can live on the surface of a cup, doorknob, toy, shopping cart, any surface for hours, right? So be really mindful of that. And just as in any illness, no matter what it is, we're always trying to keep it at bay and to protect ourselves, protect our families, protect our babies. And here's the list of things to remind you of how to keep it at bay. Okay, hand washing and good hygiene is paramount. I cannot understate the value of soap and water. Okay, also this is a little bit more challenging if you have a newborn and you have older children, but you wanna to try to minimize the contact with your older children, especially if your older child has been really sick or your older child goes to school, goes to preschool around other sick children you wanna minimize that. And one minor suggestion is having your older children like kiss their feet instead of kiss their face, right? And let them play with their feet instead of their face and hands. That's one way to kind of keep them distant. Another thing is your family, I know this is hard, but try not to share cups, water bottles, eating utensils, try to Wipe off all your surfaces with like a natural cleanser or make your own with essential oils, but like clean all the toys, all the faucets, all the doorknobs, all the surfaces, right? Cell phone, remote control, clean all that stuff off. Also, you want to wash the bedding pretty regularly and you want to avoid big crowds when, you know, during cold and flu season, if, especially if you have a baby that's susceptible to getting sick. And please be respectful of other people. And if you're sick, don't go out. Don't go to the playgroup. Don't go to the library. Please don't go. It's okay to stay home. It really is. It really, really is. And then the same things that you would do to treat it. You would take your vitamin C, your vitamin D, your elderberry, all these things act as prevention. That's the beauty of elderberry and these herbs that I mentioned before. The beauty is that they help prevent and keep the illness at bay. And then they also, if you're in an active infection, they're, right, they're appropriate, okay? Oh, one other thing that's really important, obviously, for prevention is to avoid the things that are making, weakening your immune system. So that means avoiding the stress, if at all possible, avoiding the sugar, avoiding the dairy, avoiding the contaminants like the smoke and the dust and all the things that trigger you, okay? And the other just kind of 
thing I need to let you know to give you a full talk is, you know, children, babies particularly, can get sick with RSV multiple times in the same season. So, the bright side is usually the second and third round of RSV is a lot more minor than the first time. And then the other bright side is after it's all said and done, their immune systems will be really strong after that, after all that attack. Okay? So let's just talk about when RSV becomes more serious. I'm just reiterating most of the time it's mild. However, sometimes if your natural remedies are not working or you have any of this list that I'm about to give you, go to the doctor, okay? First thing is if they're coughing and wheezing incessantly, it just does not stop. The wheezing just does not stop. The next thing is they're gasping for breath or they're breathing really quickly or their chest is sinking in. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. I'm going to role play. This is a newborn. Eventually their breathing changes, but a newborn is going to breathe. A normal, healthy newborn is going to breathe like this. They're going to breathe irregular. Let's see if you can see it. They're going to go like this. Right? This is a gasping breath. This is a retracting breath. This is a breath that you want to pay attention to. Let me do it better. Oh, no, no, hold on, sorry. It goes more like this. Their, their chest is coming in, their nose is going out, and it's really fast. And they're stressed, they're panicked. They're like looking for air. So they're really irritable, right? They might have a dark ring, a blue ring around their mouth and their nail beds might be discolored. They might be dark. That's respiratory distress. Go to the doctor. Other things might show up like dehydration. You wanna look for signs of dehydration. Like they might not have tears. You might not see tears. Or their fontanelle, their anterior fontanelle, their soft spot is sunken in. Right? There's another thing called skin turgor, like when you pinch their skin and if it recoils right away and it bounces back right away, it's not dehydrated. But if you pinch their skin and it stays kind of pinched looking, that is dehydration, right? Also, if they're refusing to feed, like they're not nursing, they're not nursing, they're not eating. And the other thing is if they're just really lethargic and really tired and kind of like hard to wake up, and the other thing is when they do cough and their mucus, if it's yellow or if it's green or if it's gray, go to the doctor. And if they have a high fever, you want to get that evaluated too, especially with any of all these other things. Those are all serious conditions. Okay, let's talk about it when you go to the doctor and they're trying to figure out what to do and you need the next level of care. So there is a test, it's called the rapid RSV test. There are a few ways you can try to determine RSV. This rapid RSV test is pretty quickly. Usually you can get the results in about 15 minutes and they're about 80 to 90% accurate. The test is more accurate in younger babies than it is in older children and in adults. And ideally it's more accurate if you can get them there in that sweet spot between like four days after the symptoms start, then it's really accurate at that point. The test is a swab. So it's either gonna be a swab up the nose or a swab down the throat, right? It's a little uncomfortable, but they're just gonna do that real quick. And then they're looking at the, the fluid that comes from the nose or the throat, and they're gonna look at that fluid. And so what they're looking for are anti antigens. Right? So antigens is a substance that the virus produces. When our immune system comes in contact with the antigen, we create antibodies and then we start to defend and protect ourselves from it. So if they can find the antigen in this uh, test, then they can feel really confident that it's RSV. One other benefit is you can also do the RSV test, this rapid test, along with the influenza, rapid influenza test. So they can check to see if it's the flu or if it's RSV. 
if you can't have the rapid test, there are blood tests, but then you can also do a chest x-ray, which you probably want to try to avoid. You want the rapid test, the chest x-ray, and they'll also probably do a pulse oximeter to try to get the oxygen saturation of the baby. And they'll listen to the lung sounds on all the lobes and, and they'll check temperature and go from there. If the baby is admitted to the hospital, every hospital is going to have their own protocol and their own way. This is a generalization of what to expect. Most of the babies will get a nebulizer. A nebulizer is going to help with oxygen support, right? So a nebulizer takes a medicine and it diffuses it into this fine mist and then the baby inhales the mist. They're going to determine if they need to give oxygen to the baby so they might give the baby ventilation like on a ventilator. They might, well they probably more than likely will give the baby IV fluids to prevent dehydration. Depending on the baby's behavior, they might need to sedate or calm the baby down, so they might give them some sedating medications, and then they might also give them antiviral medications. Essentially what they're there at the hospital for, they're usually there three, four, maybe five days at the hospital, and they're under observation, and they're looking for oxygen support, respiration, and they're trying to keep the baby hydrated. So those are the primarily thing, primary things that they're doing. This is a virus, right? So antibiotics are not necessarily appropriate for a virus. However, if this becomes RSV that then becomes pneumonia, that then becomes earaches, that then becomes more complicated, those other complicated issues might necessitate antibiotics, but that's after the fact. It's more, those are secondary infections, okay? So those are my big things that I want to tell you about RSV. I know it's a lot to tell you all at once, but I want to remind you a few things when I close this out. I want to leave you with a few gentle reminders, okay? Remember, your body is wise and knows how to heal itself. Remember that babies are very resilient and that herbs, if one used appropriately, are safe. Also remember your doctor is a phone call away if you need them, okay? A couple other things, we've made created a bunch of resources for you. Remember there are a bunch of videos under the fever tab, under the cough tab, under the earache tab. You can find them on SoundCloud, you can find them on YouTube, and if you don't want to watch a whole video, you just want to look at the blog, you'll see the blog on Burst on Botanicals, and you can just see the list that I gave you really quickly, right? We also have a bunch of products that are made that are specific for this condition, and so and we're also here to support you in that, okay? Let's, here's to, here's cheers to you, keeping moms healthy and babies healthy. And until next time, my friends, drink deep and always walk in beauty.